Hello and welcome to a new Italian PNC video and once again we go back to the map of the second ring. Once again we're back here after doing two episodes on this it's time to discover new lands and learn more things after many hours of research I went and pulled a, a basically an old nighter to research some of these topics but I think they're really really interesting and I really want to know uh, how much you will be interested in them. Uh, but let's just uh, remember what we're talking about. So this is the map of the second ring. As you can see, this is a map of the world and the world is literally surrounded by rings. In this case, there's a first ring, which is literally Antarctica, which is divided in four gates and each of these four gates it lets you explore outside of the first ring and brings you to the thing called the atlas so the first basically ring of habitable uh, continents and regions that exists outside of our known world and we explore this in depth in the original series of the world beyond the ice walls i already have a six hour video on it or different multiple episodes on it so i'm not going to be covering it once again in this video it's just a reminder for those that have not watched it uh, well basically you don't need to watch it because of course the informations on the second ring are although correlated not necessarily linked to the ones in the uh, first ring but the importance is that uh, basically we already talked about all of these places in the first ring but outside of the first ring there's a second ice wall that divides the second and first rings from each other and this ice wall is called the mountain ring so it's way larger the depth the size the just definitely everything about it is way way bigger than the one of the ice walls so as you can see we already talked about all of these things in previous episodes of this series but i think it's finally time to explore more about this world and in this case last time we explored four places it was weldrum the place you could get to more easily by uh, exiting the first ring and going into the second ring we talked about weldrum which was the land of the giant duendes and uh, basically a land of giants and mostly uh, troll-like people then we uh, explored polybius the psychonauts oasis and talked about how it basically correlated both ancient travels of the um, ancient Greeks and also and ancient Romans and also um, the ability to explore things inside one's mind and then we discovered the scorched wastes and the Iran city of a thousand pillars which was present in um, Islamic uh, theology and also all these basically factors and finally we explored the uh, continent of New Cahokia kingdom of the mounds and explore their origins according to the north american natives uh, so that's what we did last time and today we will be exploring four more lands uh, the first one i want to look at is azania the kingdom of prester john this is a very interesting topic because both the name azania and both the kingdom of prester john have very deep lore and uh, you can just check online if you want but of course i'm going to tell you because that's what we do here but first um, first when we do that let's just localize these places so Azania is in the second ring it's on basically the equator this red line of the second ring and in this case you can see that the irradiated wastes are um, next to it so their part of the land is probably not the best to live in yet we can see that it is better in the case of um, vegetation than the ones next to the scorched wastes of course Iram is almost unlivable it's a living hell and then even the Polybius the Psychonauts Oasis and Weldrum have many desert spreads which are not present in Azania, which is of course something to be noted. For the matter of arriving to Azania, the, the Kingdom of Prester John, you should take the same route we talked about with Weldrum. So exiting this uh, little, little narrow strait from the first and the second ring, then uh, basically making a pit stop into Weldrum and then finally uh, um, navigating through the coastline here all the way up to Azania. 
So that is basically where you gotta go. The Azanian continent is actually um, uh, surrounded by the Mazuic Ocean in the north and the Carousel Ocean in the south, which is the same one of New Cahokia, which we already talked about. So let's actually get into Azania and the Kingdom of Presser John. So this place is very, very interesting we actually have to analyze what we are talking about when we talk about Azania. So first of all, let's see what Azania is. Azania as a name comes from Greek, ancient Greek, and it was actually a name given to a wide region of Africa, specifically the coast of southeastern Africa, roughly from Kenya to northern Mozambique. So of course, Azania is not a name that only relies on this area, it's a name that is still used in the modern day, in fact, South Sudan, after its independence, could have adopted this name, it was proposed, and the region of Azania was basically the region we can see here in green, it, it, the, it's, a coincidence, it's a coincidence that this is actually uh, made in green, it's just the climate, but you can kind of see what the region of Azania was. And that was the name given to it in Roman times, although it was never really identified specifically with any specific area, so it was still kind of unknown. We know the Romans and the Greeks had done expeditions on it, but we don't know exactly where it is. That said, in ancient Roman times, the merchants of the area called Rapta, that was a city that was thought to be the biggest trade port in Azania, would have commercial links to the Roman uh, merchants. Uh, so we can see that just simply there was some kind of connection between the Romans and the Roman Empire and the ports of Azania in specifically Rapta. By the way, Rapta has been identified with many places in history. It could have been identified with Dar el Salam, so the capital of, of I believe, um, Tanzania, uh, if I'm not uh, recalling incorrectly. Um, and so these Roman merchants would be cruising the area because of the like just trade routes that would extend from Rome to Asia and of course it would also go parallel to Africa so they would go all the way right here and finally come in contact with these people. And that is why they started calling this area Azania. Uh, so this area was caused to be somewhat explored by them, it was not completely unknown. And Claudius Ptolemy and also Constantine of Antioch, which were two historical figures in um, ancient Rome, uh, also mentioned Azania in their uh, travels. So we can see that Azania is both what we call this continent here, but also what we call a historical region of uh, Africa. But then the other part of the continent of Azania is even more interesting because it confuses, yet it makes more sense. Uh, the Kingdom of Presser John. So I know already most people should know about the Kingdom of Presser John by now, but it is very very interesting and I will explain it to you since it's one of those deep dive topics that there's so much information on and it's crazy how, my, how little it's talked about because it's one of those things that you know uh, you expect everybody to know. Yet of course uh, school curriculums don't even mention it. I had to do my research individually but the information is out there. It's, it's not like made up or something. So uh, let's talk about the Kingdom of Presser John. So first of all, what is Presser John? Who is Presser John? He was called Presser John, Presbyter Johannes, Parete Gianni and many more names. He was believed to be a Christian ruler in a land far away from Europe, where he ruled as a theocrat under the word of God, despite not having contacts with the Catholic Church. Of course, this is in the setting of medieval times, so if you were a Christian, you kind of had to have contacts with the Catholic Church. Even the Orthodox Christians, which were the, um, the Christians that developed after um, uh, 1054, so in the Eastern Roman Empire and the Slavic populations up here still had contacts with the Catholic Church even if there were not really good contacts. But to have a Christian realm, a big empire, a big empire that was Christian and not be anywhere near Europe and also not be linked with the Pope, the Papacy and the Catholicism was something crazy to medieval Europe and medieval Christianity as a whole. So it just didn't make sense, but yet they all knew something like that existed. So it was crazy, but they did not know where it was. And this come, and this is where basically this whole thing comes to mind when it comes to this kingdom of Presser John. So is it possible that Azania was not here, but was actually outside of the second ring? And is it possible that the kingdom of Presser John was not where we are going to um, see that it was proposed it was, but it was actually right here. So first of all, let's see um, basically something about this Presser John. His wealth and power were unmatched and legend. And the only thing about him 
more famous than them were his animosity towards the Mohammedans, the Muslims, since he was said to be surrounded by them, and his country's existence at stake. So what does that mean? Basically it means that Presser John was not only a single figure, but it was also some kind of dynastic role, uh, like a leadership role, like you would call a king or an emperor or something like that, so it was not a single person in a single time period, but something that existed for centuries. And it was also something that was at odds with the Muslim powers of the area. The question is, what if the Muslim powers were able to just defeat him and he was forced to flee? So, next from that, let's see his proposed location on maps, because of course this is not only a matter of what he was, who he was, but also where he was. Because of course Europe had heard about this Presser John, they had heard about this Christian Empire, but they was not sure where he actually was, and where this Christian Empire was even located. So, when it comes to his location, there is much debate to be had. Some during the Middle Ages identified his realm with the ones in Tartaria and Mongolia. We just did a video on Tartaria, uh, the second last video we did, and it was basically this area right here, uh, basically what I'm doing with my mouse here, and it's basically the area of modern day Siberia, also this area here in Russia, also this area here in the, the Turkic steppes, and uh, all the way to Manchuria and uh, northern China. It's basically, it's this entire area. So it was proposed that it was there or in Mongolia because they did have some Khans, so some rulers of these areas which were Christians and which is documented on, so we know this was something real. But then there's also the other proposals, which are even in India and China. And according to San to John of Pian del Carpine, it was um, a Chinese prince, which controlled the way the entire area of China included the area of the uh, well, I think it was the Azur River something like that and uh, this this whole thing was kind of weird and probably improbable because we don't really know about any Christian ruler of China there are no accounts in Chinese um, history about anything like that so it doesn't make that much sense finally the third account is actually the most believable uh, the most famous and widely accepted proposal location was Ethiopia and he was seen by many as the emperor of Ethiopia or the Christian or of the Christian African realms north of it like Makuria and Alodia. So we're talking about the realms in Ethiopia right here or the realms right above it so in the region that was once called Nubia. So now we're going into African history of course I don't want to dwell too much on this because of course we have to focus on the map but of course this means that um, basically the king this kingdom of Presser John was something that was very widely identified with Ethiopia but this was not a direct um, identification because it was mostly made after Europeans had actually started to get contacts with Ethiopia because of course there was a whole um, part of history where Ethiopia the Christian Empire of Ethiopia and Europe were divided by the entirety of the Muslim states of the area so they just kind of um, identified these theories with the facts that were at hand and of course identified Ethiopia with the kingdom of Presser John although there is no proof about this and therefore this map comes to mind. So the theory the map is trying to propose is that Azania or the Kingdom of Presser John was not only in this area, it probably was somewhere outside of Europe, but the Muslims won. So the Islamic empires won in their fight against the Christian powers of the area and the Christians had to flee. So where to flee when everywhere else is surrounded by Muslims, you had to go at sea. And somehow, in some way or matter, they managed to traverse the Sentinel's Gate, go all the way out of the first ring and finally escape into the second ring and finally settle in Azania the kingdom of Presser John. So they rebuilt the kingdom of Presser John into a realm in the second ring. So that is the hypothesis that is being proposed in this map and I kind of love it because it would mean that somehow, somewhere the kingdom of Presser John is still able to exist and there's a Christian power outside of the second ring. So now that we talked about Azania, let's just consider this uh, as its possibilities. Is it possible? Uh, kind of, I guess. Is it possible that the Kingdom of Presser John survived? Definitely. I mean, Ethiopia survived for so long and it was a Christian empire in a sea of Muslim states, so it's possible that Azania as well survived. 
but is it possible that they reached all this far away? It was also the possibility that it could be something else. We saw in the map of Terra Infinita of Nos Confundum the possibility of wormholes just opening up and people being transported from one way, uh, from one place to another immediately and without um, any like stopping. So there is the possibility of just that happening and then just going from the old kingdom of Professor John to the new kingdom of Professor John and without any way to, uh, you know, just do anything about it. So there's almost many, many hypotheses we can talk about here, but we, I think we developed upon the most important ones and I don't want to waste too much time on them. So I hope you guys agree with me on the Azania topic and if you don't, you're free to leave the comments and explain whatever things you know about the Kingdom of Presser John, about Azania and about this map, about the continent we are looking at. Next, it's time to go into another continent. This time, it's time to go to Minerva, Croatoan. So, this is one of those things that, like, I had heard about previously from this map, but I had not specifically researched it up before this map. So, when researching it, it's wild. It's crazy and it is scary. I actually got kind of scared after researching this because I, I like, thought, okay, but what if this actually happens? Is this real? Okay, so let me let me just explain. So Minerva Croton. First of all, these are two words that don't really fit well with each other. They have two very separate meanings. And these words are of course Minerva and Croton. Minerva is a Roman counterpart of the ancient Greek goddess Athena, goddess of wisdom, sapience, and military strategy. So many people already know Athena, it's a pretty well-known uh, figure in ancient Greek mythology and religion, and of course I don't really need to uh, like develop on it. Of course Minerva is the Roman name, so the one that was taken from the Romans, but it is still the same concept, and it doesn't have anything to do with Croatoan. So I don't know really what the Minerva part of this continent comes from, and you're free to let me know in the comments if you have any ideas. But the interesting part of this continent is the Croatoan part. It is way more interesting than the Minerva part, let me tell you that. So Croatoan was the only word that was that remains as proof of something mysterious and alien in nature, happening to the first ever colonial attempt of Britain to settle America. So as you can see, it's crazy. It goes all the way back to the colonial ages, all the way back to the 16th century, all the way back to the United States of America, so it's something that is located in that area, and it's time to elaborate. So, let's start in the beginning. Let's go all the way to America, and the map. Let's go all the way to the United States, and talk about a guy called Sir Walter Raleigh. He was a British navigator and poet, and he was given the obligation by the Queen of England, Elizabeth I, to start the first settlements in the territories that now compose the USA. So this was not the first British settlement in the entirety of North America. They did have a settlement in modern-day Newfoundland, Canada. So it was not the first time they ever attempted something like this. But Newfoundland, Canada was a very desolate places compared to the ones in the other parts of America and definitely a place easier to settle if you didn't want to have troubles with the natives. While in this case the Sir Walter Raleigh was basically told by the Queen to start a colony in the area of the um, Chesapeake Bay basically, so this area right here. And this area was uh, kind of dangerous because of the populations living on them, because they hadn't been in contact with Europeans yet, so the diseases didn't kill them off, and therefore they were still very densely populated areas with, of course, dangerous natives, because of course, of course, if you're gonna go settle and colonize, you won't have a nice experience with the natives. That's probably the most common thing to expect. So Sir Walter Raleigh embarked in... Um, two separate expeditions and attempts to create a settlement on the east coast, but both ended in failure. The first of these attempts was carried on the island of Roanoke, next to North Carolina's mainland. So we're talking about something like right here, alright? So once again we can see this word, Roanoke. Apparently Roanoke was the name given to the island east of the North Carolina area. So you can see these small, very small uh, green things on the map. Of course, this map is very big, so you can't see these small things very nicely, but these are the islands 
um, that are near North Carolina and those one of these is Roanoke. So basically uh, the first attempt at this settlement was a failure due to its arguments and violence between the settlers and the natives that culminated in the settlers burning down a native village called Aqua Goscock and the natives retali retaliating by expelling the settlers out of their land. So of course this was the first attempt, they were unprepared, they didn't have any previous um, experience in this, so of course they just did not come prepared and were expelled after violences had broken out between them and the natives. Of course this was not the last time Sir Walter Rayleigh would try an attempt to actually establish a settlement in the modern day United States. In fact, the second attempt was more, very much more, peculiar. In fact, Sir Walter Rayleigh entrusted the creation of a new settlement near the Chesapeake Bay once again to his great friend John White, together with the settlers from England, which of the, uh, the number of settlers was actually uh, 115. So it was not a couple people, these were 115 lives that were coming with them into the new world. Uh, therefore, John White, so this friend of Sir Walter Rayleigh, and his settler families embarked towards the new world. But at their arrival, they had the unfortunate surprise of not finding anything left around by the previous settlers that were attacked by the natives, so they had to go somewhere else to settle in. So when they actually arrived in the area, they expected of course to find some you know, some fort, some fortification, some sort of settlement, some sort of physical proof that there were uh, people before them there and they could not find it, either because they were destroyed by the natives or by the, uh, you know, the climate, the tempests, whatever kind of thing that happened there, but they couldn't find it, so they couldn't settle once more in Roanoke, but they had to settle somewhere else. Uh, during the establishment of this new settlement, a settler would be killed by another Native American while he was hunting for crabs. And this, mixed with the hostile climate and environment, and the winter of 1587, which was particularly cold, uh, caused the settlers to implore John White to sail back to England to get help. So these settlers were not happy about the situation that was happening there, they could not figure out what was going on, they were not experienced in settling of course, once again, these are not the same settlers that went on the first expedition, so these were 115 people that were completely unrelated to the ones that came beforehand, and they were terrified basically, they had already had one guy dying of um, being killed by a native, and already people were dying, or at least were kind of just starving to death because of the winter. So uh, John White uh, kind of refused at first, but finally he accepted because he didn't want them to just starve and die, uh, but was only able to actually leave in 1590, so that's three years later from when the settlement was first created. This means that in three years the situation just got worse, more people died, more people starved, the resources were not enough, and of course the violences with the natives could have been greater. Of course we do not have any proof of this though, so we don't know if the violence with the natives did increase at all. So we can't just say, oh well, the violence with the natives increased, because we don't have any proof of it. Uh, when John White came back with the reinforcements, and here is the wild part, okay, so this is the part that is crazy, and which actually links up with the map of the second ring. So when John White came back with the reinforcements, the sight under his eyes shocked him. Despite being there and being completely unscathed, the settlement he had left five months prior was completely empty. All the things someone would get to go away were gone, alright? But nothing was burned or destroyed. There was no indicator of a war with the natives or a civil war in the settlement. Something was not right. The only proof that there were even people living there, in the area, was one word carved in a tree, saying C-R-O, crow, and one in a palisade, saying, all in full caps, Croatoan. So, 
What does this mean? Were they trying to reach the old settlements? Was this what they were trying to do? We don't know. This is the crazy part. This is the part that kind of scared me. Because these people kind of just vanished. There were no tombs, no corpses, no burials, no destroyed anything, no people going anywhere. And the only symbol that was linking them with anything was Kuratoan. So could it they just went back to the other island? Could they have reached Roanoke Island? What happened? What happened that made the people just vanish? There was a supposed expedition to find them on the Ivor Islands, but they couldn't go because there was a storm and it was just not worth it to die even more. So these people are never found and there was never any proof that they even existed except we all know that they did exist because of the expedition. The map of the second ring explains this by using the very very common wormhole hypothesis. These people were transported from one part of the plane of existence to another completely different one in a second, in an instant. That is why the resources that they had come with them were still there, that is why the entire settlement was still there, yet the people were gone. And the place they unexplainably appeared in is Minerva Croatoan. That is the explanation I developed upon when looking at the story and looking at this map, because otherwise there is no other thing that connects Minerva, Croatoan and the people that once were on the Roanoke Island. And this is a wild story. I always get the creeps when talking about it. And of course, this was the first time I actually developed upon it. I had seen one video made a long time ago about it, and I had not seen anything else by from it uh, in a long time. And when researching it myself, it's just crazy. Like, where did these people even go? There is another theory that the people managed to be like, um, managed to escape and go to the natives and maybe they just intermingle with them. So at some point they just didn't like the, the, the like the settlers just kind of faded away into history into genes. But there is no real proof of this anywhere, and we can know for sure. So. <laughs> The Minerva Croton hypothesis is just as likely, basically, because otherwise this is not explainable in any way. Of course, there is an easier theory that just went to Roma, just took a boat and got all the way to Minerva Croton, but that is impossible because the boats of the settlements were still there when they found them. So if they couldn't have just got on a boat and went to Minerva Croton, it had to be something more like a wormhole or a spatial distortion generator, which we already talked about vastly in the Terra Infinita series by Norskom Funden. So, with Minerva Croatoan done, it's time to go into another continent. So, as we talked about, we are going to look at Azania, Kingdom of Prester John, Minerva Croatoan, and now it's time to go north, far north. We'll be surpassing you, the land of the monopods, Xia, the palace of the Jade Dragon, and Abraxas, the glowing islands. We will be hopefully coming back to them in another moment, in another video. Probably yes, there's much to say about them too, but we're still kind of in this part where I haven't researched them, so I don't know what they're about. But we'll go back to them. Now, it's time to go and do a brief introduction in Pewi Duol. So Peiyui Duol is one of those places that I couldn't find basically anything on, swear. I looked on the internet, I looked on books, nothing. 0% of anything. I had to once again contact the creator of the map, which told me basically this kind of not riddle, but just what he knew about it. And what he knew about it was that was it was a bridge between land and sea, as we can see in title. But what that means, he explained, and it is basically something that means that everything that usually lives on land goes into water and everything that usually lives in water adventures into land. So what this means is that Pewid Wall is one of those spaces where biology has evolved in a completely different manner. So animals that we are usually um, that we usually link to the land are in the water. So things like mammals become cetaceous and go into the water. So there's more species of whales, dolphins, and so on and so forth. Animals that live in the water, so like fish, go into land. Of course, many people already know that there are some fish types that already live on land and have developed some kind of respiratory system that can uh, sustain oxygen in land. 
and these uh, these kind of fishes are the majority of the uh, original inhabitants of pavement wall and of course in time they diverged and evolved into many different species of uh, animal and specifically many different species of this kind of walking fish and of course they developed into even predators so massive animals almost like dinosaurs which are kind of like just fish original of course this also means that only every civilization that would ex that would be created on pebble wall would have to be aquatic whereas the hypothesis that humans used to be aquatic beings and this is the water monkey um i think a hypothesis theory or something like that which says that when humanity first evolved they were used to being around water and lived almost only on coasts and were used to go into the sea often. This cannot be proved uh, substantially because it's still a very unknown theory, but if this was true, then Pewit World would have the opposite effect on it. It would mean that the humans which developed around water would just be completely land-based, which means that they, uh, they would just exist in the mountains. But that is even if there are any humans on Pewit Wall. Pewit Wall is one of those places that was not really well known, and it's just not something I know much about, so you're free to just tell me what it is more about. And I don't really know how someone could reach Pewit Wall. The only way I could finally explain something like that was to take the route we saw to Azania, but even go north and stop about the Abraxas uh, the, the Glowing Islands, and then go to Pewit Wall. And that's kind of it, kind of, honestly. I don't really know much of anything about it, and that is why we want to go to the next topic, which is the most interesting topic done yet. Or actually, not really, because I think, honestly, the topic when it comes to Croatoan, Minerva Croatoan, is way more interesting than Jotunheimer, Tomb of the Titans, but Jotunheimer is something very interesting as well. So let's start and see what this, this Jotunheimer is. First of all, it's huge. It's one of the biggest continents we've done yet. It's uh, comparable to sites with a Weldrum, and it is one of the continents that is completely linked to the mountain ring. And this uh, Jotunheimer continent is actually part of the mountain ring. As you can see, it extends outside of it as peninsulas form uh, outside of it. It is definitely a kind of mountainous terrain. We can see ice peaks extend from the mountain range into its land. And we can see the mountain uh, terrain also extends all the way up to its uh, peninsulas. It appears to have three major peninsulas. This one right here, this one right here, and this one right here. And seems to be divided into uh, three kinds. But I think the main ones are this one and this one. And that is because there's a historical region, or at least a mythological one, for the division in Jotunheimer. First of all, Jotunheimer, what does that mean? What is it even about? So Jotun and Heimer are two different words that create this compound words in Old Norse. And they are Jotun, as in mystic, magic, uh, divine, and then Heimer, home, homeland, land of. So this is the land of the divine, in this case of the Jotunar. So let's let's just get back to it and s explain what Jotunheimer is. We're once again back to Nordic history and mythology as we start talking about Jotunheimer. It was believed to be one of the first continents created during the Scandinavian pagan creation story. And its sources are numerous in the sagas of the Old Norse. So already we can see there's multiple sides of the evidence that Jotunheimer is a place. There's some people that say, well, it's a place that extends on the basically the edges of the universe. Some people explain it as one of the many words of the world tree of Scandinavian mythology. Some people say it's not a real place, it's just a part of another plane of existence. Then we can see when it comes to what it actually was. The story gets more interesting. First of all, it was said to be barred from the rest of existence by ice barriers that could not be traversed by any human means, which once again corroborates with what we are seeing on the map, because of course Jotunheimer is here very clearly divided from the rest of humanity by the giant mountain ring. Even for something coming from like Asgard, it would be kind of difficult because of the Bifrost Ocean. Uh, of course, Bifrost is the, uh, historically, uh, in the in mythology, it is the connection, uh, the connection bridge between Asgard 
and uh, basically the rest of existence, including Midgard, so Earth. And as we can see in the uh, original uh, Walls of Asgard, Hyperborea, Asgard the First Empire, Valhalla kind of thing, which we talked about in the first episode, this connects perfectly with Jotunheimer. So this seems to be the part of the um, Second Ring which has all the Nordic stuff uh, developed upon, which is something similar to the um, Air Infinita map by Nosco Fundum, something like that, we did see it in his map as well. And um, the reason why this place is so divided from the rest of the world is because of the inhabitants of Jotunheimer, which are the Jotnar, which were relatives of the gods, of the ancient Nordic gods, but whose appearances resemble the ones of giants. Hence why for a long time the word Jotnar was synonymous not with god, not with any other kind of being, but literally with giants. During the creation myth, in the three poems of the Poetic Edda, which is part of the sagas of um, Norse mythology, uh, Jotunheimer of Norse religion, Jotunheimer is mentioned as the homeland of the first three women, whose birth and arrival to Jotunheimer announced the end of the golden era of the Norse gods. So as we can see, Jotunheimer is not a place that is well wished by the gods. It is actually one kind of opposite to the one the gods themselves. It makes sense since Asgard is literally here and Jotunheimer is literally here, I could see these two places creating wars within each other and creating a constant conflict between the two places. If the Jotunheimer is the land of the Jotnar, Asgard is the land of the Norse gods. It would just make sense that these would be literally just in constant, compa in constant conflict. Then we can see that the Jotnars, which are the inhabitants, the giants of Jotunheimer, are actually divided into two groups, which are the giants of ice and the giant of stone. Remember before when I said that basically I thought that these were the major dividers? This is because I believe here, in this entire part right here, live the giants of ice, and right here live the giants of stone. As we can see by the map and the coloration uh, used to it, the parts were very more gray and like this kind of uh, uh, brownish mother. It's probably the one where the uh, temperatures are a bit more sustainable since there is the equator near it and therefore the giants of stone live here, while the ones more closer to the mountain ring is where the giants of ice live in. Uh, and of course, these were uh, historically considered one living respectively in the north and the south of Jotunheimer. But despite them living so um, divided one from the other, these two groups of giants, they all take part in the Grand Council of the Continent held in Utgard, the capital of Jotunheimer in the Norse sagas. Utgard is actually also called Utgard the Loki, which is the name of the giant itself. That's a whole other deal with Norse mythology. It has a lot of characters that you should have to go into to explain all the places, but we're not interested specifically in the characters right now. We're interested more in the places. And that is why Jotunheimer is important to be mentioned that it has a major city, which is probably right there which is basically the interpolation between these two rivers, which kind of divide perfectly in half this area right here and this right area right here. So where the northern giants go and the southern giants go. Of course, meaning the ice giants and the uh, stone giants. According to ancient Norse uh, legends, the giants of Jotunheimer also hate the Aesir and the Vanir, aka the Norse gods. And also they have tried to uh, instigate conflict with humanity as well. So they are not beloved even by their own relatives, the gods, the Aesir and the Vanir of uh, Norse uh, religion. Uh, and they are also not uh, beloved by the humans, which end up being in constant conflict with them as long as the uh, Norse sagas are led to be believed. So basically this is what Jotunheimer is. When it is said to be the Tomb of the Titans is literally because in this period of time after human arrival in uh, Jotunheimer the Titans were kind of just eliminated so the giants kind of retreated into the hinterlands but they still exist in this part according once again to Norse legends. So is this place real? I don't know. It's way harder to believe than something like Azania or Minerva or even Pewid Wall, which is kind of just a weird biological bridge. 
but Jotunheimer is one of those places that you have to believe in the context of Asgard, and of course a very symbolical context in the map of um, the Second Ring. So basically that's where I'll end this episode. I have explored a lot of places as well in this episode. There's many continents in this episode that were just weird or that were just insanely cool, like Minerva Kroatoan, or places that were just kind of unexplainable like Pewitwal. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, leave a comment in the description to support the channel and help the algorithm out, and uh, subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed the content. Thank you for watching and we will see each other next time. Goodbye.